This is the McLaren 720S, which turns petrol into both power and noise. Now it's predicted even by 2030, half of all cars on the road will still run on fossil fuels. So it begs the question, what is the future of fuel? Reluctantly, I gave the petrol-powered McLaren back and got into my own diesel Sea Ibiza FR. I was visiting Ox CCU Tech, a spin-out company from Oxford University. They claimed they could use air and water and nothing more to make zero emission jet fuel. It all sounded intriguing and I wanted to learn more. Well, it was around 2010 when I started to think with Tianken how could you take a molecule like carbon dioxide, which is an incredibly stable molecule, and how could you do something with it? I'm Ken Shaw. Sure. So I'm all trained as a chemist. I'm Pete Edwards. I was professor of inorganic chemistry at Oxford. Started working with Professor Pete Edwards. Yes. Yeah. Which we start thinking we must do something big. That was the journey start. I see. And so finally we came up, as you know, in the last few years with an iron catalyst, which as you can see, is highly effective in turning CO2 into aviation fuel. So that was the real buzz of the project. This is zero emission jet fuel, made with air and water and nothing else. I'm Dr. Jane Jane. Uh, I'm the licensing venture manager at Oxford University Innovation. And I'm currently on the board of OxCCU as observer. What, what is in each of these jars exactly? This is basically a support material. The process, it is a chemical transformation. So the catalysts have lots of arms coming out. The arm is going to reach carbon dioxide and reach hydrogen and join it up. So you've got this process where the, uh, the, the reacting gases go through and at the end, of course, you get the product. But as you can see, in an industrial process, you're going to have a lot of this. It's not going to be one slab, it's going to be a, a large number of these catalyst-supported particles. So Oxford, of course, gave us the freedom to run at this. It, of course, is an amazing um, avenue for getting some highly talented people like you've seen with Tian and Xiao. And you know, unless you have a strongly worded and supported and defended patent, it's very tricky. Oxford has a tremendous structure for looking after the discoveries of the academics. The idea of this apparatus, I think, is to test the catalysts. Exactly. Hard from there, filter from here. You know, the dream is to be able to have a demonstration plant and then a pilot plant. The large-scale production of catalysts and the large-scale production of the fuel. It is it's one of the best projects in my IP portfolio, to be honest. Really? Well, I think that's all fairly astounding, to be honest. What the University of Oxford is allowing individuals and scientists like Tiankin to do is to research and develop technologies that don't exist, meaning that they then do once they've been researched and developed. And it allows them to make products like their zero emission jet fuel. And if they can make zero emission jet fuel, surely they can make zero emission fuel for just about anything. I was always scared stiff of startup companies, but I had three come out of my group in quick succession. And that, that excited me, so I thought, well, we really need somewhere in Oxford where spin-off companies can go and do their own thing. So the opportunity came to set up this science park, and that was in 2002, and I was the director until 2013. I'm Pete Dobson, I'm a retired professor at Oxford University. If we have to have a net zero carbon solution, aviation, it's a clear winner. We've got to do something to stop the 
increased consumption of everything, which, you know, is the big problem. Sure, and I think synthetic fuels can, can aid that. It's recycling, it's producing a circular economy, yeah. When you look at the uptake of new technology in cars, things like um, regenerative braking, they all started in Formula One racing. So th this is the way innovation in the car industry always seems to happen. It goes into the specialist niche areas, motorsport first, and then it goes into the other ones later. Well, our, our ambition is to show that there are alternatives to electrification. In no way do I think that there is a single solution. And I, and I think this is one of the problems with legislation. Legislation is, is driving a solution rather than a process. You know, if legislation said we need to reduce carbon dioxide, let the engineers have their head and find out the best way of doing it. Of course, electric vehicles would be in there, but so would some of the other solutions. So what we're proposing is something that sits alongside. Where the synthetic fuels come into their own is when you need a lot of power. Now, in our case, it's for high performance and light weight, in other words, high energy density, is also relevant in trucks, um, in aircraft, even in trains. I think we'll need gasoline, diesel and jet fuel for quite a long time because we're going to have the fleet of vehicles that are going to be using them for a long time. So what we've got to do is try to produce those in lower and lower carbon fashion. And one of the ways to do that is synthetic fuels. So we've got a number of reasons why we still are needing to scale up. So first of all, we need a lot of hydrogen and we don't have the hydrogen production capacity yet. Where it's, it's developing very quickly. Yeah. Second of all, we need a lot of electricity and we need low carbon electricity, otherwise it defeats the purpose. So we need more and more wind farms, solar, nuclear as well. Yeah. And then third, we actually need to bring the cost down. So at the moment, it's not cost competitive with fossil-based gasoline. Long distance vehicles, mm -hmm. uh, particularly heavy goods, mm -hmm. and then shipping. Yeah. We're not going to electrify shipping, so we're going to need some kind of fuel. Sure. And that might be a synthetic hydrocarbon, it might be hydrogen, it might be ammonia. So there will be liquid fuels being used, I think, forever. Sure. Our current uh, big example was, was flying a, a single-engine plane, um, and that was fueled with 100% synthetic gasoline. It was a collaboration with the RAF, mm -hmm. and we actually got recognised by Guinness World Records and then we're, we're looking at some gasoline applications in motorsport. So we want to demonstrate all three types of fuel, you know, sure. aviation fuel, diesel and, and gasoline. And we're looking at scaling up our facilities. I had been fascinated by how many people were already making synthetic fuel, but I wondered what was the next step in getting this stuff to the pumps? We need um, a clear signal for the fuel industry um, to start investing in, in e-fuels in addition to, to biofuels, for example. And um, we also need a signal for car manufacturer that a climate neutral combustion engine is still be allowed in future. We need a change of the energy taxation. Um, the energy taxation for fossil and renewable fuels in Europe is currently the same. That makes no sense um, if you want to incentivize um, climate friendly technologies. If we introduced our road fuel in the UK, it would be taxed at the same rate as conventional petrol and diesel. If you use renewable fuels instead, um, then you could have a climate neutral internal combustion engine. So um, it's, it's definitely the wrong signal um, to, to ban the engine. Uh, we need to ban fossil fuels. I think like with COVID, we have to listen to the scientists a bit more than we have in the past. The switch away from fossil fuels uh, can be a lot faster. Uh, than people imagine at the moment. Then um, we have a business case and then we will see investments and that will ramp up um, the availability of synthetic fuels. Currently, synthetic fuel is aimed at sectors like jet planes and boats, which are trickier to electrify. But cars? Perhaps this carbon zero fuel of the future could have a place alongside electric on the roads of tomorrow.